A very good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so how many, uh, how many, so we have this uh, really nice panel which is on the fintech startups. And how many of you sitting out there are actually in the fintech industry? Okay. Wow, all of them, great. Thank you for joining us for this panel. So you know, uh, so I am from Asia, the entrepreneur.com, and we have like some massive number of fintech startups out there who are trying to pretty much regulate everything from, right from, uh, I would say, the banking sector to insurance to the rest of it. But what is most interesting is that the, the kind of problems that they're facing are so unique in fintech that I've not seen those kind of challenges coming in different sectors. So I think I have a very rich panel out here today who's going to say that how they've made their way through these challenges because finance industry is, of course, by and large sort of controlled in a lot of ways by the government. And because of that, there are unforeseen challenges, unforeseen regulations, licensing, which is a problem that exists in the fintech industry. But having said that, and through all the problems and challenges that do exist, the last figures that I read were something like over more than $70 billion have been um, sort of backed globally the fintech startup ecosystem, which is not bad at all. You know, there are about uh, 6,000 fintech startups which are at least in there, though I think a lot more have started and probably even folded up over the time. So I'm going to talk to my lovely panel out here about what they have done or how they have sort of crusaded through all the challenges that exist in the fintech ecosystem and been able to grow big. Uh, so let me start with you, David. Now, David's startup is actually dealing with helping student loans to be maneuvered, uh, students' loan to be sort of uh, done through the fintech ecosystem. So can you tell us a little more about it and how do you sort of go through all the challenges that exist and are still able to do, uh, uh, you know, to be able to service financial sure. technology? Sure. Um, so let me acknowledge, this is a very complex conversation to have in 15 minutes across four people, uh, fintech and regulation. Just because in fintech, there are multiple types of fintechs predominantly that fall into three categories of lending side, asset side, payment side. And then there's a horizontal component to what we're talking about here in Europe and being from US, US, based in UK, based in Germany, the geographical component which is going to change by country, so bear with us in, in what's probably 10 minutes, 12 minutes left. It will be an incomplete conversation at, at best, but hopefully a couple of nuggets along the way. So with that, um, we fall in the lending bucket of FinTech across the US horizontal. Specifically in that little square, we fall into student loans versus personal loans, small business loans, mortgage loans, et cetera. In that small subcell, I can say a word on regulation and fintech. In the US, the reason, in part, the, the market is $1.5 trillion um, is because the way the system works right now is that colleges and universities charge a lot of money uh, for tuition, room, and board. And because the government will fund um, the entire cost of attendance every single year, there isn't a natural market check or a natural market incentive for schools necessarily to keep tuition inflation under control. And so what you've seen is the cost of tuition in the United States rise faster than just about any other sector. Um, in 1990, I think there was about 25 billion in outstanding student debt. In 1990, 25 billion in outstanding student debt. And in 2018, 1.5 trillion in outstanding student debt. So when I think about regulation, when I think about government involvement, in the, in, the, in the case of student loans, in large part, the government's involvement, I believe, is disincenting schools and universities from keeping costs in check, which is requiring a lot of people like myself as a consumer and why we exist as a company to need to take out debt. Now, in order to take out debt, the cost of that debt is incredibly expensive. Um, and then we become a regulated entity just like banks and other lenders uh, that have to comply with a patchwork of state-by-state -state lending license regulation to ensure that we are constantly compliant. I can say a whole heck of a lot more. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to say <laughs> at least one thing, so I'll pause there. Sure. 
No, I, I completely understand that in, in the student debt ecosystem, probably just you, you have way too many hands to sort of be able to bring to the table together and then to get them in the same ecosystem, in the same framework to really make your ego find fintechs sustainable. And I'm sure out there, uh, a lot of people, they have in fintech ecosystems which are terribly complex just because the number of people involved and the number of user cases involved are so large. And to get them on the same table with that technology is really what is the more harder part. So thank you for that. I mean, I'm going to come to you. And if you could please, I'm not going to get into too many formalities because time is short. So if you can just tell us a little more about your fintech startup. So we, um, I just spoke a few minutes ago on this stage. But we are often viewed as a fintech because one of the things our users do with our product is they buy stuff. They pay online. And today, the volume is starting to be meaningful. It's about a billion dollars a month of e-commerce transactions our users do. And so when we try to work with banks or large payment networks on doing things with them, we touch, uh, particularly in the US, the fact that it feels like a heavily regulated industry. But to a large extent, this is the old part of the problem. It's all regulation coming from the banking world, trying to adapt to how payments are evolving. And yes, that area feels over-regulated at time, and it's certainly stifling innovation. On the other hand, as I was alluding to earlier, there are areas of the problem, of the broader problem, that are grossly underregulated, which is why uh, seeing what, uh, you know, when you think about GDPR, GDPR is meaningful also from a fintech perspective because it creates obligations for all these fintech companies in terms of what they do with their data. And if you think about a market as big and complex as the US, or in fact the rest of the world excluding the EU, there is no global privacy framework. So I think it's really a question of balancing the over-regulation in certain areas that is stifling innovation, but also the under-regulation that is creating a situation where companies are not accountable for their gross misconduct. And this is what leads to giants like Facebook, Google, begging their own government to regulate them, which is something that has never happened in history and which stays a lot. Sure. Great, point taken. Um, I'm going to come to you, Marcus. Marcus runs a cryptocurrency-based fintech. And as we all know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's still a big debate going out there in the world whether cryptocurrency is a thing, is, is not a thing. So back in Asia, I can tell you, one country to the next, um, you know, in one country they accept cryptos, and the other country they absolutely, it's illegal, to the point where a country like India has seen a lot of cryptocurrency companies, fintechs, actually being folded up in the last uh, one year. So what is your take in cryptocurrencies, and do you think it becoming the, the future currency of the world? Yeah, I think from a, I mean, from a, is it something or is it not? I think, you know, the hundreds of billions of dollars under management and, you know, tens of millions of users is enough to prove that there is something there. I think from a regulation point of view, you know, we, we're in an industry that's largely unregulated in most countries. And you would think that that makes it easier, but in fact, it actually doesn't because in most countries, we still, well, in all countries, we still self-regulate. And the reason we self-regulate is, A, we think it's the right thing to do, but more importantly, even though, you know, most, India's an exception, there's a few exceptions, but on average, you know, we, we deal with regulators in over 20 countries. And most regulators are actually quite pragmatic about our industry. They could have shut the thing down a long time ago and they didn't. They could have banned it, they didn't. Largely because of Uber and Airbnb, now they're going, hold on, maybe we need to give some time for innovation. We, you know, we, and, and so the regulators actually be really fantastic. I think where it's been hard is with the banks. Because a lot of banks don't want to give uh, crypto companies bank accounts because that's a risky thing for them to do. And we've had at least three instances where we've had really famous regulators that are good regulators give us in writing letters to say, give this to the bank. They can come and meet us. Please bank this company. We are 100% okay with it. And the bank won't do it because, again, they're worried about the risk of anti-money laundering and so on. And they don't have the resources to, to kind of put onto this. So what we then do is we self-regulate. And the banks, actually, the banks that we do have accounts with become, you know, we, we ask them, what do you need from a regulatory point of view? And we try and comply comply with that. So they like this regulatory layer. And now, just, just maybe an interesting, you know, a funny anecdote is also what's happened is we've seen other crypto companies that don't regulate at all. For example, they don't do any KYC or AML. 
And then we phone the regulators and we go, listen, this is not fair, right? Why, why don't they have to do it, but we are doing it? Because we're actually unregulated. We're voluntarily doing it. And then the regulators say, yes, but please carry on doing it. And I say, but do I actually have to do it? And they go, you don't have to do it, but it's just, it'll be nice if you continue to do it while we figure out our position, right? Um, but I do think in the end, cryptocurrencies is probably one of the biggest opportunities for regulators globally. Because as we can hear now, regulation is really putting a stranglehold on a lot of, especially banks and, 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 and fintech. And if you can imagine having one global payment system that uses the same technology to do KYC and AML, the economies of scale on that is absolutely enormous. So we think cryptocurrency will actually bring down the cost of regulation for the entire financial services industry and make it a lot easier for companies to operate. Sure. Thank you very much. And you yourself, I know you were just talking here before this panel started, and um, you, know, you run an insure tech company, and while we all consume insurance, but the insurance is so regulated as an industry. So where do you feel um, you know, your challenges of growth were there, and how did you overcome them to sort of grow? Uh, yes, and I mean, maybe I actually have a bit more a controversial view on it. But uh, you know, very often startups are put in a box, and everyone is saying, "All right, um, we need to have different rules, or like regulation needs to be a bit more understanding for startups and all of this." I don't think that at all. Like, I think as a fintech startup, like at least speaking for us, we don't want any specific rules. Like, we don't want to have a, let's say, a stripped down set of regulation rules because people will never take us for serious if we don't fulfill the market standards. And I mean, there's a certain standard that people have been put out there to protect the customer. So I actually think that, um, to a certain degree, at least startups want to be taken serious and they need to sort of then be 100% compliant with the same regulation standards as every other company out there, no matter how big. So that's my view on the, let's say, general regulation, speaking about uh, insurtechs, maybe. Um, and secondly, actually, sometimes I uh, also think about regulation in a like, positive way. Because, um, I mean, as long as the rules count for everyone the same way, and as long as they're not destroying your business, they might actually give you a competitive edge. Because if you compare, like a new rule comes out, and every company in the industry has to adjust to this rule. And a startup, you will be good and faster in adjusting to this rule. And there's maybe a new opportunity opening up uh, with this new rule. So actually, every time when the regulator comes with something new in insurance, we immediately look at, hey, what opportunities is this actually opening for us? because we are in a position to execute super fast on that. So I'm not necessarily saying that regulation is bad and like, you can really see and gain massive opportunities from it. OK, so in one line, I would like you to tell me, I mean, you know, you, you're already sort of found your way within the FinTech space. Now, be it small or big. But if you were to grow and you were to think yourself as probably the Facebook of FinTech, what, what is the forward linkage or a backward linkage that you would do in your business to achieve it? I'll start with you, David. With respect to regulation? No, with respect to growth, your growth of your fintech. So if you were to think beyond student loans, what, what is it that you would think? Which, which ah. is the area of fintech you would grow into? Got it. So for us, we think a lot of the value has to do with our customer. Uh, and so even if you look at our own platform where we first started as a refinance platform for those who graduated and we want to lower the cost, we've now gone into in-school student lending and we've also followed our customers into their employer. Um, and so I believe we'll continue to follow our customers over time who are at the relative beginning of their customer life cycle on average at age 32. Uh, so you can imagine folks have additional financial needs uh, that, that cut across both the lending side and asset side of the business, and I would expect us to follow our customer there over time. Sure. I mean, I'll... Yes. So I'll give you two for the price of one. <laughs> uh, we operate in a space, as I said in my talk, where uh, the addressable market is 3 billion people, 1% has a solution, 99% don't. So the only obstacle to our growth is ourselves, which is how quickly we can make our value proposition better than the alternative, which is to do nothing. And so our biggest growth driver is actually people. It's hiring great people as fast as we can to solve this very hard problem. Super. So for us, it's also quite simple. It's just making it really easy for our customers to get to their first cryptocurrency. 
it's still incredibly hard to do. It's a it's a problem. Everyone's already on I you know blockchain and the next thing and the next thing. But the basic problem of someone just easily getting their first crypto has not really been solved. So just focusing on making that easy for the customers through education, easier onboarding, a lot of security and safety. Um, so like in Germany at least, insurance is very closely connected to retirement as well. And I mean, on the one side, people have no clue about their insurance products. On the second side, many people don't have any clue about their retirement situation. So I think the second space that we're going to look at is how we can bring transparency and good advice to retirement solutions as well. Sure. So um, that's all the time we had, folks. Uh, so I think any question that you may have, you probably have to just sort of get hold of them and ask it from them. But thank you for joining us. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, I wish you all the very success in the future of the integrity.